Thank you so much. It's great to be here. It's great to be here especially because I see a lot of friends here. There are people in this room I've known for more than 30 years and um, when I was a speech pathologist for, for more than 10 years. And it gives me great pleasure to be able to share with you today. And I'm more than happy to um, answer questions along the way. We have plenty of time so we can make this fun and relaxed. Um, so I'm going to be reviewing the clinical syndromes of primary progressive aphasia. And that's very important to think of them as clinical syndromes. They're not diseases, and I'm going to get back to that. Um, that reflect the area of brain that are most affected by pathology and grossly correspond to a particular pathology. So this is the number one point I like to get across to patients when I diagnose them with primary progressive aphasia. I try to tell them it's not a disease. No one dies of PPA if they come to autopsy. The pathologist never says this person had primary progressive aphasia and that was the cause of death. PPA is the clinical syndrome. It's a collection of symptoms and it reflects a neurodegenerative disease that causes that. And neurodegenerative diseases that cause primary progressive aphasia are pretty, pretty few, um, but they can affect different areas of the brain. And just like stroke, that causes very different syndromes depending on where it is in the brain, these diseases cause very different syndromes depending on where they, are, they first start in the brain. And it happens that these diseases have a predilection for certain parts of the brain. Some affect more frontal areas, some reflect more parietal areas, one affects more inferior temporal and anterior temporal regions. And so the syndrome grossly corresponds to a particular pathology, but there's no one-to-one -one correspondence. But the giving somebody a diagnosis of one particular variant of primary progressive aphasia can be helpful and I'll try to show you that because it can kind of give them an idea of what problems might come next, what the course of their condition might be, um, what other problems they might develop and so on. Now I'm going to be also describing some advances in diagnosis. I'm going to talk about some recently developed tests and imaging for identifying particular variants. There are three main variants of primary progressive aphasia. And describe advances in prognosis, some imaging data that may help predict the rate of decline. And describe advances in treatment and talk about some emerging investigational treatments for at least temporarily de delaying or declining, delaying the decline or possibly even improving at least temporarily language performance. Before I go on, I want uh, to um, disclose that I don't have any financial relationships to disclose other than I get some financial um, uh, uh, support for some editorial activities. But mostly, I want to disclose that most of this work was done by my students and postdocs and research assistants. And I just, I mentor them um, in this work. And all of this work was supported by NIH, mostly NIDCD. So primary progressive aphasia is deterioration of language for at least two years before decline in other cognitive functions. And that was the original description by uh, Mesulam in 1982. Now, um, Mesulam doesn't really require, nobody requires two years before you can make a diagnosis now. So most of the time, people come to us after they've had symptoms for a nine months or a year or something. You, you don't have to say that to them, well, I can't tell you what you have. I'm, we have to wait another year. Um, you can say, I think this is primary progressive aphasia if they've really only had a decline in language. Um, there are three main variants of primary progressive aphasia, as I mentioned, are clinical syndromes or a collection of symptoms that frequently co-occur, but that means they don't always co-occur. We see dissociations. We see um, some uh, people who just have one or two of these symptoms, and so they don't neatly fit into one of the categories. So we have a lot of uh, studies that have a group called unclassifiable. 
because many patients come to me with just naming problems and spelling problems. And they may have naming and spelling problems for a year or so. Those, that doesn't meet criteria for any of these three variants because all three variants have naming and spelling problems. Um, so also at the end of the disease, some people don't come to us until they have very severe language problems in all domains. And so you really can't classify those patients either. Sort of the end of any neurodegenerative disease is pretty severe impairment. It's affected all these areas of the brain. So you can't really tell except maybe by history sort of where they started. Um, as I mentioned, the main variants reflect the area of the brain most affected by disease and give you a clue to the underlying pathology. Um, the, dis the underlying disease often determines what problems the person may develop in the future. So some of the diseases are associated with motor problems or swallowing problems, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so the three main variants of primary progressive aphasia are distinguished by distinct patterns of language impairments and supportive patterns of atrophy on imaging. Um, all three p variants, as I mentioned, have prominent naming impairment. So we're going to talk about each of these three variants. And they, these are described in a uh, sort of consortium paper, a consensus paper, um, that was the result of uh, three or four meetings of people who are doing research in this field from a number of different centers. Um, and Mary Lou Gorno-Tempini is the uh, first author of that paper. So non-fluent agrammatic variant primary progressive aphasia is really characterized by effortful halting speech with inconsistent sound errors or apraxia of speech and or agrammatic language production, difficulty in producing complete grammatical sentences. Now these two things do dissociate and Joe Duffy is going to be talking this afternoon about uh, primary progressive apraxia of speech. When that's the only problem, you can't call them primary progressive aphasia because they don't really have a language problem. They just have a motor speech problem. And so it's just uh, the syndrome that he will be talking about. But if they also have aphasia, they have some spelling problems, they have naming problems, and they have apraxia of speech, um, then it's likely this non-fluent agrammatic variant primary progressive aphasia. Some supporting features are that they have impaired comprehension of syntactically complex sentences. Now those of you who work in stroke aphasia say, gosh, you know, some of these components sound a lot like Broca's aphasia, effortful halting speech, agrammatic language production, impaired comprehension of syntactically complex sentences. So that's, it's not surprising that uh, they also have spared word comprehension, spared object knowledge, and it's not surprising that they sound a lot like patients with Broca's aphasia. Um, and they, I'll show you, the area of the brain is very similar. So this is a patient with non-fluent agrammatic variant, um, and So I just wanted to show you how severe the speech production can be, and sometimes they have spared writing. Now, she was writing these nouns perfectly well, but she did have difficulty writing verbs, um, and that's not terribly unusual. A lot of these patients have more difficulty with verbs than nouns. And the area involved is uh, here in the posterior inferior frontal gyres and Broca's area, as well as the insula. It's the area most commonly atrophied in this non-fluent agrammatic primary progressive aphasia. Now, the pathology underlying this variant is usually tau pathology. Now, tau pathology is also seen in Alzheimer's disease, but this is a dis different isoform of tau. And the disease, when they come to autopsy, is almost always one of these three diseases, corticobasal degeneration, progressive supranuclear palsy, or frontotemporal lobar degeneration uh, caused by tau. Now, frontal lobar, degen lobar degeneration can also be caused by TDP43, which we'll talk about. Um, can be caused by Pick's disease or agerophilic grain disease. 
Does everybody know what a jirophilic means? So a jirophilic is literally uh, silver staining, but I, a jirophilic means uh, friends with. So a jirophilic is friends with RG. Um, so. <laughs> Um, the uh, cortico, it, this is important because these patients later in the disease, after a few years of having primary progressive aphasia, if they have corticobasal degeneration, they often develop symptoms as the disease spread of uh, other symptoms of corticobasal degeneration, which is often in, in the case of uh, non-fluent primary progressive aphasia, where it starts on the left side of the brain, is right hemop. Uh, spastic hemiplegia, rigidity of the right, usually the right arm because that's closest to the speech area. So they have apraxia of speech and then also apraxia, uh, idiomotor apraxia. Then they develop rigidity of the right arm very often. They have some Parkinsonism. They may have tremor. Um, they can develop gait difficulty, particularly because of rigidity of the right leg. Progressive supranuclear palsy is a very closely related tauopathy, and in fact, it may very often has uh, the same genetic mutation underlying these two diseases. So you can have one person in the family with this uh, genetic mutation uh, who has corticobasal degeneration or corticobasal syndrome at least, and another person who first uh, presents with uh, uh, progressive supranuclear palsy syndrome and another person who first presents with a primary progressive aphasia, just depending on exactly where the disease starts in the brain. So lots of people think that corticobasal degeneration and, and PSP or progressive supranuclear palsy are really kind of the same underlying disease um, because they can be caused by the same um, underlying mutation. Now, progressive supranuclear palsy, many of you speech pathologists may see because of swallowing problems. It, when it, it presents with the PSP syndrome, the main problems are swallowing problems, falls, um, and uh, eye movement problems, particularly difficulty looking up. So someone whose underlying disease is PSP may develop these problems later on after their uh, apraxia of speech and speech and language problems. They often develop eye movement problems, swallowing problems, and falls. So it's important to, to look for these problems um, and be aware of them, especially the swallowing problems. Frontotemporal lobar degeneration is also caused by tau and it can cause changes in behavior and personality. So if the disease is moving forward in the brain, particularly affecting orbitofrontal cortex, um, then they, they may develop more behavioral problems later on, change in personality, comportment problems that we often see in behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia. Um, so one of the problems, you may see why this can be confusing to families, is that in neurodegenerative disease, often the same word is used for both the pathology and the syndrome. And that probably started with Alzheimer's disease because Alzheimer's disease is used for both a syndrome and an underlying pathology. So it would be great if we got away from that and started saying Alzheimer's dementia for the clinical syndrome of memory, primary memory problems and and impairment, progressive impairment in at least one other cognitive domain, and used Alzheimer's disease for the proven pathology. Um, the same thing with corticobasal degeneration, the syndrome of having rigidity on one side, Parkinsonism, apraxia could, is often, or should probably best be labeled corticobasal syndrome, and corticobasal degeneration probably ought to be restricted to the pathological disease. There's no real PSP syndrome um, uh, that has um, other than uh, PSP, um, but uh, it should probably be called exactly that, PSP syndrome. Um, the, uh, again, PICS disease and angiophilic grain disease are really just pathological uh, diagnoses. Um, less commonly, the non-fluent variant, um, 
non-fluent agrammatic variant can be caused by uh, TDP43 or even Alzheimer's disease pathology. Alzheimer's disease can start anywhere in the brain. So it can cause, as you may know, a primary visual problem. It can cause, um, in rare cases, this, uh, any of the variants of, of primary progressive aphasia. So a semantic variant primary progressive aphasia has two uh, core features, and both of these must be present, as opposed to the core features of non-fluent variant. Um, and that is impaired naming of objects, more than actions, um, and impaired single word comprehension. Um, so they have to have impaired naming and uh, difficulty with word comprehension, but supporting uh, features are impaired object knowledge, particularly for low frequency or low familiarity items. Their reading or writing is often impaired, um, but they make regularization errors. So what some people uh, would call surface dyslexia, surface dysgraphia. So they read the word yacht as yatched um, and so on. They read by phonics, spell by phonics. Um, they have impaired reading and writing comprehension. Their repetition is generally spared, um, and they have spared grammar and motor speech. They have paragrammatic speech, like patients with Wernicke's aphasia. But they're not exactly like patients with Wernicke's aphasia. Their, their language can sound very similar with extended English jargon. However, what's different about them is they all eventually do have impaired object knowledge. So it, unlike a patient with Wernicke's aphasia who might speak in jargon but behave perfectly normally, may be able to cook, may be able to mow his lawn, may use his objects appropriately, this is eventually affects both temporal cortices, left and right, and they have difficulty really understanding the meaning of an object. So they put orange juice in the coffee maker, they, one of my patients, uh, boiled pizza for dinner. Um, one patient spread uh, peanut butter with a can opener. They use objects inappropriately because they don't understand them. And one of the really key features of semantic variant primary progressive aphasia is they'll often say, repeat a word that you said and say, I don't know what that means. So they'll say, uh, glove, glove? Well, I, I, that sounds familiar to me. I know I know one. I know I've had one. Yes, I think that's one that I've done before, but glove, glove I don't know what that is. I don't know the glove. Um, and that, they'll say that very frequently in conversation. So this is a patient describing the cookie theft picture. Or not. I've seen this so many times, I can tell you what she says. <laughs> it's a very fluent speech. So she's a girl and he's a girl and she's, a, I know he's the one that I did before. She was the one, she's, oh, I like that one. That's the sort of thing they say. So it's mostly extended English jargon, lots of errors, like he's a girl. Um, and the areas that are involved are mostly the anterior and inferior temporal cortex, more than the posterior temporal cortex that we see um, in stroke. And it is bilateral, but it's more on the left than on the right. The most common pathology is frontotemporal lobar degeneration caused by TDP43. TDP43 is tau DNA binding protein of 43 kilodaltons. Um, and it is less commonly caused by Alzheimer's disease, dementia with Lewy bodies, um, which you all may know Robin uh, uh, Williams just died of, um, he had at death, um, and CJD, um, other mixed pathologies, and so, so on. CJD is Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease. Um, usually that's a very rapid uh, uh, deterioration in Cognition. Now, logopenic variant primary progressive aphasia has core features of impaired word retrieval in both conversation and naming tasks, so it's very prominent. They're very, very anomic. Um, they also have impaired repetition of sentences and phrases. So they have impaired working memory. Um, they sound very much like conduction aphasia. Um, 
They, the supporting features are speech sound substitution errors in conversation and naming tasks, spared single word comprehension and object knowledge, and an absence of, dif of difficulty producing uh, grammatical sentences. Although they do produce sentence fragments because they're so anomic, especially later in the course. They'll say, oh, you know, that's the, the boy's climbing the, oh, I can't think of it. Um, and he's trying to steal, um, you know, the things from the, um, you know, so they don't really produce complete grammatical sentences, but they start off and they, until they get to a word they can't think of. Um, so here's an example. So you can see the really dramatic difficulty in repeating sentences. She gets some idea for a week, sun, sunny, um, but she really doesn't, uh, can't repeat the exact words in a sentence. So the area of brain involved in uh, logopenic primary progressive aphasia is generally superior temporal cortex and uh, inferior parietal <coughs> cortex, um, particularly uh, uh, the angular gyrus and supermarginal gyrus, and these are areas important for um, uh, working memory, and particularly phonological working memory. And the most common pathology is amyloid plaques and neurofibrillary tangles of Alzheimer's disease pathology, but it's not in the same distribution of typical Alzheimer's disease. It usually spares mesial temporal structures, at least until late, although eventually these, these will be involved and they will eventually have episodic memory problems. So there are a group of us who study primary progressive aphasia were asked to get together, um, supported by um, NIH, to come up with a bunch of tests um, and also supported by the um, FTD Association, Association for FTD, um, to come up with tests that would help identify some of these patients with um, uh, primary progressive aphasia as well as behavioral variant FTD um, and distinguish them from Alzheimer's disease and particularly to use these in um, the Alzheimer's disease research centers. Um, and so we came up with a module of tests. Now these are just sort of ones that we, they, they had to be given really quickly um, and they had to be um, ones that could be used uh, very easily in a in a research center across, um, across uh, the country. And they, they aren't perfect, and I'll talk about some of the, the problems with them. Um, but the, the idea of some of the language tests was specifically to try to distinguish between these variants. Um, and so this is a work in progress, as I mentioned. Some of the things that were included were letter fluency, and this was really used as an executive function test to evaluate for uh, frontotemporal dementia, word and sentence reading to look for that uh, uh, surface dyslexia, um, semantic associates, and, um, and that's just identifying which pairs of pictures are semantically associate, associate, associated to identify patients with semantic uh, variant primary progressive aphasia. A sentence anagram test was used to evaluate sentence uh, grammatical sentence production um, was the idea um, to uh, try to uh, identify those patients with a grammatic variant, um, and I'll talk about some problems with that. And the reason for using a sentence anagram test is uh, many of these people, as you heard, the first patient really couldn't talk at all, so how could you tell if she's agrammatic? Um, now, she did write, and she was agrammatic in writing. Um, she had good single word writing. Um, but if they can't write, and sometimes they can't, sometimes they can't even use their dominant hand, um, we wanted something that could look at um, a, a uh, sentence, grammatical sentence production, and we thought this would be a good idea, but it turns out it also requires semantics and executive function um, and is hard for all of the variants. Um, sentence repetition, obviously, to identify the logopenic variant, noun and verb naming. Some of the patients, as I mentioned, with um, non-fluent variant are only impaired in verb naming uh, and not in noun naming. Um, then there were some, some things just to make sure that they they didn't have a more global impairment. So things like uh, Benson complex figure memory test, 
Then there are caregiver scales for observation of key behavioral variants to identify patients with behavioral variant FTD. Because remember, their problem is really a problem in uh, deterioration in comportment and behavior. So there aren't really good tests for that. It's really observational scales that pick this up. And a neurologic evaluation and standardized diagnostic lists for symptoms. Um, and this is just really to show you, you don't have to read any of these scores, just to show you that it has been tested in a, a, a fair number of people so far with all of these variants and with FTD as well as uh, normal uh, controls, 160, this was actually a year ago, um, and patients with uh, behavioral variant FTD. Um, and so uh, those tests are available if you're associated with any Alzheimer's disease uh, research center if you're interested in giving them. But I do want to talk about the fact that the battery needs to be refined. Um, there are some problems. So my postdoc, Rajani Sebastian, had noticed that the sentence anagram test, which involves unscrambling words to produce, uh, actually the way it's, it is in the, in the NAC module, is to make a, a question about a picture. And that turned out for our patients to be too difficult. Um, most of them just couldn't get the idea of making a question about the picture. So we changed it a little to make it a sentence about the picture. So half of the sentences are just subject, verb, object sentences, and half of them are passive sentences, but they're still fairly simple, like the horse is ridden by the girl. Um, and they have to, they're given scrambled words, um, and the idea was to detect a grammatism independently of a proxy of speech. Um, and she hypothesized really that all variants of primary progressive of a aphasia are impaired on this syntactically complex um, sentence production with anagrams because this task requires semantic processing and working memory. So she tested 63 patients with primary progressive aphasia on this test. What she found was that there was really no difference across the variants, even though the, the variants were not different in terms of at least time post onset of symptoms. It's really difficult to have a, a a measure of severity um, because the semantic variants always do worse on things like the mini mental status exam because they have comprehension difficulties. So we don't have a good measure of severity of primary progressive aphasia. We could possibly use total brain atrophy or something, but we use time post onset. They didn't vary. The non-fluent variant patients um, actually did the best on average, although there was no significant difference in this test. Logopenic variant and semantic variant really didn't show any difference. So they all had impaired performance. And the performance on the anagram test correlated with performance on, of semantic processing, and we used the uh, pyramids and palm trees test that I'll talk about, um, and working memory. So it correlated uh, fairly highly with repetition, as well as disease duration. Um, so it seems to really be sensitive to just all problems um, in these patients. So the ability to produce grammatical sentences with anagrams to match pictures is impaired in all variants of PPA and really doesn't seem to distinguish between them. So we're currently working on a more reliable assessment of grammatical uh, sentence production in uh, connected speech. Um, so we also wanted to develop a very quick test that would reliably identify semantic variant PPA across cultures. And many people across the country have been using the pyramids and palm trees test, which is a test you all probably know about um, that involves matching one of two pictures to a picture at the top. It's a nonverbal semantic uh, association test. Um, you originally, uh, described by Howard and Patterson. There's 52 items on this test, so it's a pretty long test. Um, and this is an example, and this is one of the good examples, I would say. So the person has to identify um, which of these items is most associated with the picture at the top, the glasses. And you know, we, we wear eyeglasses on our ears, so if you were just using episodic memory, you could, you could choose either of these, but eyeglasses are mostly meant for the eyes, so the correct answer is eyes. Now, there are some items we objected to, and people in Baltimore, I don't know about other cities, um, can't answer this question. I can't answer this question. Um, 
which is more associated with a rooster, a snake, or a worm? Well, in the United States, in, you know, in Maryland, chickens and roosters eat corn. Corn is our number one product. Um, so they, we don't think of them as eating either worms or, or snakes. As it turns out, I looked this up in Google, and, and they will eat either worms or snakes. So there really isn't a correct answer to this. Um, but according to uh, the test, uh, I think worms is the correct answer. And I'm told by uh, my friends in England that they taste much better um, if they are worm fed as opposed to corn fed, but I don't believe that. Um, another item that we, people tend to get wrong is which is, goes better with acorn, a pig, or a goat. Now, in the United States, most of us think of squirrels as eating all of our acorns. Um, so, you know, it turns out, and I Googled this too, but pigs and goats will eat acorns. I mean, that, pigs and goats will eat anything you give them, right? Uh, but apparently in England, there's uh, pigs uh, eat acorns, um, and maybe it's associated with um, a kid's story. Um, so uh, maybe Winnie the Pooh, does, that, does the piglet eat acorns? I don't know. But that's the correct answer. Um, Eeyore. Eeyore eats acorns. Yeah, but that wouldn't. Does that, that wouldn't explain that item. Um, so they selected 14, uh, we selected 14 items from the palm trees and pyramid test that seemed to be more culturally unbiased, i.e., you know, we could answer them, um, but also that we thought people in other cultures could also, outside of England, could also answer. Um, and we, we also wanted a much shorter test. Um, and we tested these people in um, age match controls in the US, Greece, and Argentina, just because I happen to have collaborators in those countries, um, on this short, and we hypothesized that the short version of the palm trees and pyramid test could better distinguish normal from uh, PPA patients uh, better than the 52 item version, and that it could distinguish semantic ver variant primary progressive aphasia um, <coughs> from other variants and would correlate with atrophy in the left temporal pole where semantic variant uh, patients have atrophy. And so what we found was that a score of less than 12 on this 14 item version had a specificity of 100%. It's not terribly sensitive because remember early on somebody can have PPA without having uh, object uh, semantic impairments, can have, um, they, can, they can have be labeled with semantic variant if they just have word comprehension deficits and not picture comprehension deficits. Um, a score of uh, less than 13 had a specificity of 96% and a sensitivity of 71%. So the area under the curve was quite high. Um, so we used a score of less than 13 to identify semantic variant primary progressive aphasia. And um, the uh, we scored um, scores of, sorry, we used a score of less than 12. Um, and 12 to 14 was considered normal, and zero out of 50 controls scored outside the normal range on the short form. Um, but on the longer form of 52 items, using the norm, published norms, 60 out of 20 Argentinians, 7 out of 12 Greeks, 5 out of 18 American controls. Um, so really, uh, you know, close to er, over a third of the patients um, scored outside the normal range on the full PPT. So control performance was significantly more frequently con um, classified as normal on the short form versus the full form. And we found that the correlation between volume of the um, volume in particular uh, voxel regions um, correlated with the short performance on the short form of the palm trees and pyramid tests, and those areas were in the inferior temporal cortex on the left, um, as well as in orbitofrontal cortex on the right, where they also seem to have uh, atrophy in some of the white matter tracts. So then some of them, uh, Murray Grossman, who is a, a collaborator at University of Pennsylvania, and Chadi Onikis, who's a, uh, one of my collaborators in the psychiatry department and directs the behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia uh, clinic at Hopkins, 
um, and some other colleagues at University of Pennsylvania all got together, decided to see if this could really effectively discriminate, um, sort of pathologically proven semantic variant primary progressive aphasia from other uh, forms of primary progressive aphasia. And so we evaluated initially 50 primary progressive aphasia patients who either had pathologically confirmed uh, diagnosis or pathology confirmed by proxy based on either genetic mutation or CSF um, uh, correlates of uh, pathology. And they were fairly mild. Um, this is their mini mental status exam uh, score, which really didn't vary uh, significantly across um, the variants. And as you can see, this is really mild for a patient with aphasia. Um, they tend, patients with aphasia tend to do very poorly on the mini mental. Um, they had similar degrees of education and age. And what we found was there uh, was a significant difference across groups on the 14 item palm trees and pyramids. And even though they were very mildly impaired, semantic variant had significantly lower scores compared to logopenic variant and compared to the non-fluent agrammatic variant. Um, logopenic variant did not differ from the non-fluent variant. Um, so this just shows the performance on the 14 item palm trees and pyramids and semantic variant versus non-fluent agrammatic and logopenic variant. So this 14 item test, which is much faster to give, seems to provide a rapid test of nonverbal semantics that can distinguish semantic variant from healthy controls and semantic variant from the other variants um, and correlates with anterior and temporal and orbitofrontal atrophy and so may distinguish frontotemporal lobar degeneration pathology from other pathologies relatively early in the course. So any questions about anything before I go on? Um, so I, now I'm going to talk about some work by David Race, who's one of my post, who was one of my postdocs, post um, on another sort of early diagnosis of semantic variant primary progressive aphasia. This is unpublished work using eye tracking. Um, hopefully, he's going to submit it very soon. Um, and it is, um, it, I think it's fascinating. Um, so he's, he has a background in eye tracking, and we decided he wanted to evaluate initially the semantic deficit in patients with different variants of primary progressive aphasia. And so he used um, eye tracking to, to evaluate different trials of a word picture matching task. So the patients heard a word, and then they had to identify the picture that goes with the words. But he also evaluated the amount of time they spent looking at each target in the array. And there were four different arrays. Some of the arrays had um, coordinate semantic foils like dog, cat, rabbit, um, and the foil is uh, you know, one of those. Um, and then others had associate semantic foils. So the target is dog, and then the foils are things like bone, and uh, collar, and leash. Um, and then there were linguistic associates. So the target is dog, and the, the foils are things like ear. So there's words like dog ear. Um, and or another example would be butter and fly, So because butterfly is a word. And then there were filler trials, which turned out to be the most interesting. And the filler trials are unrelated foils. So the target is dog, and the foils are coffee um, and chair and things like that. So we, he had three controls and nine participants with primary progressive aphasia. Eight had semantic variant, four non-fluent uh, agrammatic variant, and three with logopenic variant, four who were unclassifiable. Um, and again, unclassifiable in this case meant they just had anomia and or agraphia, so spelling and naming problems. Um, they all showed a high level of accuracy on the task, um, and especially the fillers, almost 100% accuracy in identifying the target on the filler task. And so that's the offline performance, or it's the, the performance on the online task, but it's when they actually have to match the eventually choose the target. Um, but the eye tracking performance turned out to be what was interesting. So eye tracking they, was, they looked at the a measure of the proportion of looks to each target and how long it takes to, to look at the target more than to the unrelated pictures. So this is an example. Um, the target is, is camera, 
So he measured how long it took them to look more at the camera before they actually chose it than to look at these unrelated pictures. Now here's a control. A control almost very quickly uh, looks more at the target um, and he collapsed all the unrelated foils because they were all very similar. Um, and they stop looking at the unrelated foils and just choose the target. Um, this is another control that shows very similar performance. And this is uh, the time it took, less about uh, 600 or 700 milliseconds to, to, to look more at, significantly more at the target. Um, this is a patient with a logopenic variant, primary progressive aphasia, and shows very similar performance to the um, controls, very rapidly just is looking at the target. Another, this is a patient with non-fluent agrammatic variant, again, they don't have semantic deficits, and almost immediately looks only at the target. Semantic variant were very different, so even though they eventually chose the target, they kept looking back at those uh, unrelated foils. They weren't ever quite sure they had chosen the right thing. Uh, they kept looking back. Eh, is this right? That could be, you know, could that be a camera? Looking back at all of them. They really were never sure of their answer. This is another patient with semantic variant. Again, just never really was sure of his response. Kept looking back at those unrelated. This is a patient, the ones who are most interesting with unclassifiable patients who just had anomia and agraphia. So the ones who we subs, so he tested them two years ago, and now we've, they've come to a diagnosis. Um, and actually, almost three years ago, he tested them. And many of these now have a diagnosis. And this particular patient, when he was tested, was unclassifiable. But now he's, he has semantic variants. So back, when he te was tested two or three years ago, he already showed a pattern that was similar to semantic variant primary progressive aphasia, where he was kind of looking back. He never got to 100% looks at the target. He was only about 60% looks at the target, and the rest of the time he was looking at those unrelated foils. This is another patient. So even before he met criteria for semantic variant primary progressive aphasia, was showing this pattern on eye tracking where he kept looking back at those unrelated targets. This is a patient who was unclassifiable initially, but later developed problems with um, repetition, not semantics. And he had, a, he had a pattern when he was unclassifiable that looked just like the normal pattern and looked like the pattern of logopenics. Um, where he looked almost immediately and eventually 100% just to the targets. Um, and this is a patient who's kind of remained unclassifiable, who has remained unclassifiable, and showed a pattern that was more like the controls and logopenics. Um, and so if we, if we classified patients as having less than 80% looks to the target by 1,200 milliseconds, so they were never really sure of their, their decision, um, even though they eventually chose the target um, in the accuracy task, um, uh, all of those were semantic variant primary progressive aphasia eventually. Um, and there was one patient, uh, sorry, all but one. Um, and if they didn't show that pattern, none of them had semantic variant. And then we looked at the correlation between the level of atrophy and the time it took them to look mostly at the target. And that correlated with, you can see in the areas in red, so only areas in the anterior temporal poles bilaterally, um, so here on the, on the right, as well as the left, um, and in the uh, temporal uh, pull and uncinate. So uh, this seems to be a, a eye tracking using word picture matching, even with unrelated foils, seems to be sensitive to semantic variant PPA, even before individuals meet criteria of impaired word comprehension in offline tasks, and seems to be correlated with atrophy in left and right temporal pull. So it may improve early diagnosis and suggest an early marker for this um, FTLD, frontotemporal lobar degeneration caused by TDP43. Um, now I'm going to switch gears and talk a little bit about predicting the course of decline. Um, 
this initial study is by Donna Tippett, who is a um, speech language pathologist who's recently been working with me half time in research in my lab, and she's also is a clinical position in otolaryngology, um, doing uh, speech language pathology. So she um, she decided she was very interested in answering a clinical question: how long, how quickly is it, is this individual going to progress um, to a severe level? And this is an important question to families because they want to know, you know, how, how soon is he going to have to move to assisted living? How soon are we going to have to do, you know, get help in the home and so on? Um, and we, it's been noted by many people um, and particularly by the Mayo Clinic group um, who've published, um, uh, particularly in logopenic variant, that um, Patients with PPA show variable rates of decline in language um, from one to two years till the time of death to two decades or more. Um, I've been following some patients for more than two decades. So we hypothesize the rate of decline, that is the change in score um, uh, divided by months since onset, may be influenced by primary progressive aphasia variant, age, education, and language rehabilitation and studied 46 patients with primary progressive aphasia um, over 11 months, and then looked at the variables that independently determine the rate of decline. Now, we are doing this. We're repeating all these, this study, I have to tell you, in over 200 patients now, um, and using much more sophisticated statistical analyses. Um, but I'll just give, there are some conclusions, I think, that can be drawn from this preliminary study. Um, and this is just the breakdown of patients. Um, there were fewest patients with non-fluent variant, and then uh, similar rates in the others, and 14 patients who were unclassifiable. And the most interesting finding to me is that there were patients who had slow rate, very slow decline, um, and patients who ver showed very rapid decline in all the variants, but they showed decline on different tests. So the non-fluent agrammatic variant showed the most rapid decline on the HANA, which is the Hopkins assessment of naming actions. So a more rapid decline than the other variants on this test. So remember I mentioned they often have difficulty with verb naming. The semantic variant showed the most rapid decline on the, the short version of the pyramids and palm trees test, that 14-item version, and that's not surprising. They're the only ones who showed really significant deficits on that test, and they showed the most rapid decline on that. Um, they also showed um, some, de you know, decline in naming. Um, the logopenic variant patients actually showed the highest or uh, fastest decline on the Boston naming test. Um, um, except for the unclassifiable, who actually showed the, the highest rate of decline on the Boston naming test. Um, so there were, there were um, as I mentioned, rapid decliners and slow decliners in all of the groups, um, and the only uh, variable that really significantly associated with PPA decline was the, the type. Um, the semantic variants did show that great, the fastest decline um, in this group um, compared to the other variants. Um, there was some tendency for patients receiving speech pathology to show a, f a slower rate of decline than those who received no therapy, but this is difficult because they receive very different therapies, very different amounts of therapies, and so on. Um, so it's really hard to look at. Um, but there was no association between age or education and rate of decline. Um, so we decided to see if we could predict the rate of decline using imaging instead. So we've been doing um, imaging a little different than um, other people by looking not just at how people's brains compare to normal controls, but how they compare to one another. Now we do um, take each brain and, and uh, try to register it to an atlas using a very um, technical, uh, um, this LDDMM process of normalization, um, but, and we use high resolution scans to do this, the, but the most important thing that we do is we register each scan to the individual's own scan so that we can look at which voxels in that individual um, sort of disappear over time or atrophy over time. Um, so one of our first studies looked at longitudinal imaging of patients with PPA. Um, 
and there were five patients with logopenic variant, eight patients with semantic variant, and two with uh, non-fluent variant um, who had longitudinal imaging at least six months apart. Again, I'll show you these early studies, although we have a lot more patients now, and so I think the published work will, will include a lot more patients. Um, we looked at Spearman correlations between change in regional volumes and change in functional scores. What I'll show you, this is um, a, the, on the top line shows you the um, patient's first MRI, the second line shows you the patient's um, MRI six months later, and the third line shows you the difference um, between the first and the second. And what I really like about this is you can use it in an individual to show them where there's change. And um, if you just looked at these two MRIs, it wouldn't be obvious where there's difference. Um, it's really hard for the, uh, the naked eye to see. But when you compare them, once you've registered them to each other, you can show in blue the voxels that have disappeared at time two that were there in time one, or the voxels that have gotten smaller. And red are the voxels that have gotten larger, where there's, there are new, there's new space. Um, so the ventricles get larger over time um, in these patients. They are showing atrophy. And salsa, in some cases, tend to get larger. But what we see in this patient is that there's atrophy um, in this um, area in the uh, posterior temporal cortex and inferior temporal cortex, more on the left than on the right, but bilaterally. What we see in all these patients is there's bilateral atrophy, particularly when we compare them to themselves and not to age match controls. Um, and we see this uh, to some degree in the in, uh, temporal uh, pole, but much more sort of in posterior temporal uh, cortex um, more inferiorly. And then what we saw across, this is the group data, um, this was just an individual's data, um, that the change in word comprehension and uh, correlated with the volume, with change in the volume of the middle temporal gyrus and change in the volume of the angular gyrus. Um, so it is, uh, and this is just one patient um, who had semantic variant primary progressive aphasia, um, and she, her word comprehension deteriorated from 73% to 0% between these two time points when she showed atrophy, as we can see in the posterior temporal cortex here. Um, now, just to look at something completely different is trail making tests, uh, uh, you heard uh, Frank talk about is the, an executive function test, and you all know it well. The part B, um, performance correlated with change in the volume of the inferior frontal orbital cortex. Um, and we can see that in this patient who had semantic variant primary progressive aphasia. But remember, I said that most of these patients with semantic variant have frontotemporal lobar degeneration, TDP43, which is associated with a behavioral variant. So very often late in the course, which this guy was, they start, as the disease moves more frontally and orbitally, they start to develop more symptoms of behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia with both deficits in executive function, but also behavioral problems, and he did have some behavioral problems. And you can see his atrophy. He has a lot of atrophy in the anterior temporal poles, as you would expect from um, his diagnosis of semantic dementia, or semantic variant primary progressive aphasia. So he has no anterior temporal pole. But if you compare him to himself over this six-month time period, where he's now showing atrophy is orbitofrontal cortex primarily. Um, and some even in frontal cortex, uh, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, bilaterally. And uh, so he deteriorated on the trail making test, um, part B, we allow them uh, uh, up to 300 seconds. And so he took 84 seconds and then uh, really maximum time, he couldn't really do it. Um, so progressive decline in specific tests is closely related to progressive atrophy in focal areas, providing further evidence that these areas are critical for associated tasks. So another example I didn't show you is um, left supramarginal gyrus seems to be critical for working memory, and it was also correlated with uh, atrophy 
atrophy and supermarginal gyrus was correlated with performance on repetition tasks. As I showed you, uh, atrophy in left orbitofrontal cortex was associated with uh, changes in executive function. So individual longitudinal imaging might provide some clues to where the disease is progressing or spreading. Um, and then I'm going to talk about some work now on imaging um, to help us with prognosis. And this work is really by my colleagues, Susu Momori and Andrea Faria, who are terrific uh, collaborators in um, the radiology department. And we initially studied 16 patients with primary progressive aphasia using structural um, imaging, resting state fMRI, um, and uh, a DTI. Um, nine months apart and looked at their performance on naming tests, the Boston naming test and, and the Hopkins assessment of naming action, to see if we could uh, find any imaging predictor of, um, that could pre predict the decline in naming. Now, lots of people have shown that imaging, changes in imaging are associated with changes in performance over time. Um, particularly decline in various things, and I showed you that already. But the, sort of the holy grail is that you want something that at time one can predict where they will be nine months later, 12 months later. Um, so we looked at a lot of things. We looked at volumes of gyri. We looked at various DTI measures of white matter tracts. We looked at correlations between homologous cortical regions on resting state fMRI. And the reasons we looked at homologous correlations is these are the most stable over time. Um, that if we lie you in the scanner and evaluate the correlation between bold response in uh, homologous regions between left and right and prefrontal cortex and superior temporal gyrus and any particular area on the left will be highly correlated with, with the right. And that's really stable over time. Um, and so we looked at those areas. Um, and, and that's not as true with primary progressive aphasia, in part because they have atrophy more on the left than on the right. So I'm not saying this is something you know, deeply theoretically important, but it is a marker that might be able to tell us what's happening in the brain. Um, so we found that baseline atrophy in any particular area really did not correlate with subsequent decline in naming. Um, it did correlate with current decline, and the change in atrophy in, that, in specific areas, as I showed you, did correlate with change in naming, but the time one atrophy could not tell you what was going to happen nine months later. The initial structural MRI did not offer direct markers of subsequent decline in either the Boston naming or the HANA, um, using DTI measures um, also. The decline in volume of diverse brain regions correlated with the degree of decline in the Boston naming and the HANA, and I'm going to show you those data. And that's just consistent with things I've already shown you, that progression of atrophy correlates with progression of functional deficits. The initial volume of the left inferior frontal gyrus um, and ventricles correlated with their further degree of atrophy and enlargement. So it could predict, if you are the amount of atrophy you had in those areas could predict that those areas were going to show further atrophy, but that didn't correlate with, with performance on naming. So that wasn't as useful. So this is just to show you the areas um, on, that were associated where change in atrophy or uh, change in the volume of these areas was all associated with change in the Boston naming test. So again, it's not just the uh, temporal, anterior temporal poles, but remember I said that all variants are impaired in naming, and all of these areas um, were significantly associated. Uh, atrophy over time was significantly associated with change in the Boston naming test over time. And the left, sorry, this is actually the right, obviously, and this is the left. So um, all, almost all of the temporal areas and the uh, post inferior parietal cortex, as well as inferior frontal gyrus, um, to a lesser extent, just this pole area um, in the left. Um, for the HANA, the verb naming test, we see a lot more, the same regions in the temporal cortex um, and inferior parietal cortex on the left, 
um, but also a lot more in uh, sort of Broca's area here. And that's been shown in a number of studies of healthy controls um, and in uh, stroke patients that uh, inferior frontal gyre seems to be strongly more associated with verb naming than with noun naming. Um, but that's still not what we are most interested in. What we're interested in is prediction of subsequent decline, and the only baseline parameter that significantly correlated with the rate of subsequent decline in naming um, after correction from multiple comparisons was the resting state connectivity or functional correlation on resting state between homologous prefrontal cortices. Um, and so we did this twice. The first time was even higher, was a correlation of 0 0.80. Um, and then uh, the second time was 0 0.69. Um, so these are two different populations of PPA patients. Um, and uh, so it seems to re be really stable. Um, and so the correlation, uh, how what the bold activity at rest in the left versus right, how well they're correlated, um, could predict the, the rate of change in Boston naming test. And this just shows you, um, in 30 healthy controls, this shows you the, all of these uh, 185 regions of interest that we look at on the left. This shows you the 185 regions of interest on the right and the color depicts how well they're correlated. The red is um, uh, very strong correlations, um, and blue is very strong negative correlations, and brown or gray is, is weak correlations. And so you can see homologous regions are strongly correlated in healthy controls. This is very stable over time. And this is what we find in PPA patients. This is a group average. And what we find is much less strongly cor strong correlations um, between uh, homologous regions. Um, there are some areas that are highly correlated, but others that aren't. And we also find that sort of language cortex, the areas in green, frontal, so inferior frontal, Broca's area, prefrontal cortex, um, all of the temporal cortex and inferior parietal cortex are strongly correlated with each other, even at rest in healthy controls, um, whereas in PPA patients, the frontal regions are not correlated with, with uh, temporal regions. Temporal regions are not uh, correlated with um, uh, each other. So. Um, this seems to be something promising we're going to continue to look at, but it may tell you that, you know, give you an idea of how quickly the person is going to decline in naming. Now, it may be that it just depicts, we don't, con we don't um, control for the degree of atrophy in the prefrontal cortex, so it may just reflect that there's an imbalance in atrophy, that there's more atrophy in the left, there's more neuronal dropout in the left compared to the right, so there's less bowl signal on the left compared to the right. But it sort of doesn't matter what it reflects, because it's just a very easy thing to measure. You stick someone in the scanner, they don't have to do anything, they lie there for 10 minutes. If you can get a measure like this in 10 minutes that can predict something later on, it's, it's really nice no matter you know, why we get this. Um, so I'm going to end by talking about advances in treatment. Now I will point out these are investigational. Um, we are using uh, the, the main, really the only treatment for primary progressive aphasia is speech-language pathology services, so uh, language therapy. I, I refer all of my patients for language therapy, and it can be very helpful, um, both in te treating patients to use compensatory strategies, sometimes augmentative communication strategies are particularly helpful for patients with non-fluent agrammatic variant, um, but there are many other things that can be um, useful, sometimes direct treatment is most useful, um, using word communication notebooks or picture communication notebooks or all kinds of things that can be useful. Um, but there's no disease modifying treatment. There's no proven medical intervention that reduce the rate of decline in PPA. And so even temporary improvement or stabilization can improve the quality of life. Um, language therapy, as I mentioned, has been the focus. There have been a number of studies showing that uh, language therapy can be useful. Um, and these have been published. Um, but we decided to try TDCS, um, which transcranial direct current stimulation, which is a safe, non 
uh, painful, non-invasive electrical stimulation that has been shown to augment language therapy in particularly post-stroke aphasia, although the studies have all been fairly small um, and there have been relatively few um, randomized control trials. We hypothesized that unaffected brain regions might be recruited by enhancing neuroplasticity. Um, and, uh, you know, the, if you look at the literature, both anodal uh, TDCS and cathodal TDCS using one to two milliamps over unaffected brain has um, been shown to, to result in temporary subthreshold change in membrane potentials um, when paired with behavioral task. And animal studies suggest that it really influences long-term potentiation and long-term depression of neurons in the entire network that's affected by um, the TDCS. So wherever you stimulate, as long as you stimulate over part of that network, it really can change the, um, that, the probability that that network will be activated by the same stimulus later on. Um, the, the, uh, area affected by TDCS is really very coarsely localized, um, but it can be further localized by pairing the TDCS with the behavioral task. So it's the task itself. If you use a naming task, it, act, it activates the naming network in inferior frontal gyrus, superior temporal gyrus, um, and so on, and really bilaterally. Um, and if you, active, if you stimulate an area of that that network, the entire network, um, will, will have some change in membrane excitability. Um, now, numerous studies have demonstrated that TDCS alone, without concurrent behavioral uh, tasks, really doesn't affect language. Um, and that, uh, so we decided that to use TDCS with, to augment language therapy. Um, as I mentioned, and I've just listed a few here, aphasia therapy alone does result in some improvement in primary progressive aphasia. So we thought we might obtain even larger effect sizes or large, um, with T a TDCS, but we would need fairly uh, large number of participants to show a difference between TDCS and sham because these patients um, do show an improvement with language therapy. Um, so we actually, um, I'm very thankful that uh, NIDCD has um, funded uh, a randomized control trial with Kirana Tipkini as the PI. Um, she had published a preliminary study um, that was funded by the Science of Learning at Johns Hopkins. Um, and she's now uh, started this randomized control trial and we just have patients flocking to this study. Um, she has people lined up. So, so far I'm gonna present some of uh, the first 19 studies. I don't wanna take away her thunder, but um, she's presented some of this already um, at Academy of Aphasia. But um, she has found some improvements for trained items. Um, she initially reported in just six patients improvements with trained items with spelling therapy with or without TDCS and improvement on untrained items and ma maintenance of gains only with TDCS. So she hypothesized that um, improvements in spelling would be obtained um, and really oral naming too she's studying now. So both oral and written naming could be um, uh, in, uh, value obtained with combined intervention, TDCS uh, uh, plus language therapy, and that would be greater than language uh, intervention alone. Um, and also hypothesize that differences would persist at two weeks and two months post-intervention, even though this is a progressive condition. Um, and she also hypothesized that improvements with TDCS plus language therapy would generalize to untrained items. And so she's uh, studied prim uh, patients with uh, written language difficulties. As I mentioned, both um, she's studying now both oral naming and written naming. But patients can have two different types of written naming problems. Um, and their uh, spelling can be treated with either a phoneme to grapheme conversion treatment or a lexical treatment, depending on which one was impaired. And she stimulates over the inferior frontal gyrus. Um, so far, she's looked at 19 patients, five with logopenic variant, 11 with non-fluent variant, and three with semantic variant. Um, and these are just 
some of the characteristics. They all get 15 sessions of sham therapy um, or, and, then, and 15 sessions of real TDCS. All of them are accompanied by language uh, therapy. And there's a two-month uh, uh, sh- washout period in between the therapies. Um, and they are randomized to whether they get the sham therapy or the, um, the real TDCS first. Um, they get evaluations at two weeks and two months post-treatment. Um, and it is a uh, double-blind control trial. So this is just the treatment um, for phoneme to graphene conversion. It's based on some old studies of basically treating phonics um, using keywords. Um, and the lexical treatment is basically a copy and, and repeat. Um, they have to uh, spell it five times, trying to teach them how, spellings of irregular words. Um, and this just shows the, um, the study design. As I already mentioned, they get 15 sessions of sham or 15 sessions of stimulation over left IFG um, or the op- oppos- uh, opposite. So she did um, some statistical analyses um, to try to separate out the effects of um, treatment um, and the effects of uh, period. Um, And I'm not going to go into detail about the statistical analyses. Um, But what she found was that there was an effect of the um, TDCS versus sham, particularly at time one, when there's the greatest effect. and I'll just show you some examples of patients. So um, all 19 patients have improved, but they do improve more with the TDCS. So TDCS is in blue. So this is one patient, for example, who first got TDCS and improved, um, and this is at uh, the, the various evaluation periods. Um, and this is immediately after treatment, this is two weeks after treatment, and this is two months after treatment. So the patient who received TDCS first improved with TDCS and kind of maintained the gains, and then when the person received sham, he had lost a little bit of gains and really didn't improve very much um, over time. This person received sham first, improved a little bit on the trained items, didn't really uh, show much change over time, and then when he received TDCS, improved even more and, main, and mostly improved, uh, maintained those gains. This patient, again, when he received TDCS first, improved quite a bit, pretty much maintained those gains. When there was a washout period, he did uh, uh, deteriorate more and then uh, showed uh, a, a little bit of improvement with sham. This patient improved a little bit with sham um, and then uh, showed a little drop out, drop, and then improved with TDCS. So this shows the, perform, the change with um, untrained items for all 19 pr- pr- uh, participants. And there was a, a significant improvement um, at the period one with the untrained items. And there was significant improvement at two weeks and two months with the untrained items. Um, and so similar results are seen Um, for the untrained items um, with TDCS. So TDCS plus spelling intervention was more beneficial than the spelling intervention alone. Treatment effects seem to be better retained at two weeks and two months uh, post-TDCS. Again, these are preliminary data. She just started her trial back in uh, the spring, um, and it's going to be going on for five years, so we hope to have much stronger data um, at the end of five years. but we're excited about the preliminary data. So the mechanisms um, by which TDCS seems to augment uh, language therapy are really not known well. Um, some, there have been some preliminary results with magnetic resonance stimulation um, that suggests that, um, that, that synaptic plasticity, which uh, results in a change in metabolites, um, may be uh, responsible for um, the effects of TDCS. Um, and re- there are some changes also in um, resting state connectivity that are seen in stroke patients, though this has been show- demonstrated much less frequently, or not at all as far as I know, with uh, PPA patients. So um, Karana is hoping to look at um, resting state 
uh, TDCS, or she is looking at resting state TDCS um, before and after treatment, um, both uh, before and after sham and before and after real TDCS, to see if there's greater changes in connectivity with the TDCS um, compared to the sham. Um, and I presented these results yesterday. These are actually just from a patient with stroke, um, but this is the kind of thing we'll be looking for in the PPA patients. Um, this is a patient who received TDCS, and during the four weeks she had um, no treatment uh, with TDCS, she really didn't show any change in uh, connectivity. And the changes in connectivity are shown, this is the, um, the uh, correlations um, between areas, between homologous regions again, in these various language networks, and these are changes in correlation, homologous regions in motor and default uh, networks, and if there's a uh, increase, um, it is red, if there's a decrease, it's dark blue. There's no change, it's kind of yellow or green or light blue. And for most areas, it, without TDCS, there's really not much change. When she received TDCS, she did show a change to high correlations in the inferior temporal gyrus and superior temporal gyrus pole, and to a lesser extent in inferior uh, frontal gyrus, whereas a control during the same time periods showed no change, and she also showed uh, very little change and maybe a little decrease in these other areas, non-language areas. So we think that TDCS may have a, 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 an effect on connectivity, particularly in the language network. Again, um, we think TDCS, if it's paired with a language task, will only uh, affect changes in the uh, language network. So in conclusion, primary progressive aphasia is a group of clinical syndromes. It's distinguished by um, language characteristics that reflect different locations of atrophy and usually distinct pathologies. Um, there are tests being developed um, and standardized to efficiently identify these variants. The short form of the pyramids and palm trees tests, or even possibly eye tracking um, with word picture matching with um, not un uh, related foils seems to identify semantic variant primary progressive aphasia patients early in the course. And the rate of decline varies widely across tasks and in individuals across all variants, um, but it might be predictable using this resting state uh, functional connectivity MRI, um, particularly looking at the degree of connectivity in prefrontal cortex or other homologous regions. Language therapy seems to slow the rate of decline on some language tests, and it might be augmented with TDCS. The results are um, preliminary. The, um, there is a study currently in progress. We are also doing a large study of language therapy alone, which is in progress. We're collaborating with Georgetown University on this to see if we can reduce the rate of a decline in all variants of primary progressive aphasia. And what we've seen is there is um, that different variants uh, respond differently. The semantic variants um, seem to improve most on the trained items and less on untrained items. Um, whereas logopenic variant and non-fluent variant can uh, show more uh, generalization to untrained items. So I'm going to end by thanking all my collaborators. You can imagine this work uh, takes a lot of collaboration. Um, there are people in my uh, neurology department. These are all my colleagues who uh, refer patients and um, have been great uh, support, uh, but particularly in neuroradiology, um, I've had wonderful collaborations with Andrea Faria and Susumu Mori in particular on this PPA work, and the biostatisticians, the resting state fMRI data um, can be analyzed in many different ways, so we're still going to be looking at these data in a variety of ways um, with these fabulous um, biostatisticians. And then my laboratory is uh, filled with uh, graduate students and undergraduate students, medical students, and postdoctoral uh, fellows who do all this work, um, as well as some faculty collaborators um, like Donna Tippett and Marlise Gonzalez-Fernandez.
And then um, we have, I have a number of collaborators across the country who've been working with me, and even in England, Jenny Krenyan has uh, been a great collaborator in the PPA uh, work, um, and uh, uh, my friends Julius Friedrichsen and, and Chris Rorden have been collaborating for a long time, as well as Greg Hickok and Murray Grossman at Penn, um, and Rhonda Friedman and Aaron Meyer at Georgetown, as well as other collaborators at Johns Hopkins. Um, and finally, I'm very grateful always um, for funding, particularly from NIDCD. Um, and the science of learning is funded by grateful patients. So here's some of my collaborators, and thank you to all of you for listening, and I'm more than happy to take questions. Thank you very much. That was very, very interesting, and I have actually lots of questions, but I'll keep it limited. Um, First of all, it's about um, identifying these um, people with PPA in places where there is not a center or a lab dedicated to this. Um, your first video you showed reminded me very much of a client who actually came to us with a vascular stroke, but has declined so, so much. And so one part of my question is, is that a common um, characteristic or a, a finding that you would see? Um, so maybe if you want to ans answer that, and then I can sure. go to part two. Sure. I would say about half of my patients come to me um, with previous diagnosis, at least somewhere, with a diagnosis of stroke. Okay. But what tells you it's not a stroke is their MRI um, and the fact that they're getting worse. Now, I did present some data that some patients get worse after stroke, um, but usually they don't decline to the degree that these patients decline. And it's usually not really in the deficits caused by the stroke. It's not specifically language. If stroke patients decline, it's sort of more generally in cognition. Um, it's not specifically in their aphasia. Um, so if you see really worsening of aphasia, it's usually primary progressive aphasia, but look at their, somebody needs to look at their MRI. Often they're read as normal. So neuroradiologists, and I love neuroradiologists, I could not deal without them, but they, they're very reluctant to read focal atrophy. And the reason is there's a huge amount of variation in what's normal. Um, and so they won't read, they're, they're great at telling you what a lesion is. They're much better than I am at saying, you know, this is a stroke or this is a tumor or what kind of tumor it is. Or they're terrible at telling you where that is in the brain. So sometimes they say it's in the parietal lobe, and it's really in the temporal lobe, or, you know. It's, so don't just read the report um, if you want to know where something is. Um, but they don't read focal atrophy. So they'll usually say it's normal if it's PPA. If it's a stroke, they'll say it's a stroke, though. Um, and occasionally they will, if it's a late PPA, they will misread it as, a late, as chronic stroke. Because if there's just encephalomatia in a focal area, it looks kind of, it could be a stroke, particularly if it, you know, if it's in Broca's ear, there's just kind of missing tissue in Broca's area, which there is in some of these non-fluent patients. They might read it as stroke, but then if they get a, another scan, a CT or MRI, and it's bigger, it's less, a whole lot less likely to be a stroke. Um, so, or if you see a lot of gliosis around, um, it, around it, and it's not in a vascular territory, and you, you, it, it's not a stroke. Um, so vascular lesions are in vascular territories. Thank you. Uh, my second part of my question is, um, really, I was encouraged that language therapy, at least at some level, seems to be um, helpful in slowing progression, at least. Um, and I work in a um, college-based clinic, and that seems like a good place for some of these people to come if we can find them and get them there. And I'm wondering if you have any suggestions about how to do that, how to outreach, who to outreach to um, if we're in an area without, um, at least that I know of, a yeah. known center that's um, working with these patients. So I think university clinics are great um, because these patients are really informative. They teach pa they teach the graduate students a lot, and I always tell my patients, you know, graduate students provide really great therapy because they have the most time, and they're, you know, they're being graded for their performance, and they, you know, they're innovative, and they think about this, and they don't have 10 patients they have to see that day. Um, so I usually refer my patients to university 
clinics. One of um, our university clinics um, has just decided to do something brilliant, um, which is to provide a support group for families of people with PPA. Um, and I think that's going to get them millions of referrals <laughs> because these p families really want support um, and they don't get it because they don't really quite fit in the Alzheimer's disease um, support groups. There are some FTD support groups out there, but they're mostly filled with pe families of people with behavioral variant. And a lot of these patients don't have behavioral problems. The problems are communication. And so they're going to have, I think, a lot of people show up who we did have a small um, scale, which is the Snyder Center for Aphasia Life Enhancement had a support group um, for a while um, for people with PPA, and people loved it, but it was just, it, it was so hard um, to, to continue that for the people who are organizing it. Um, so I think, you know, if you're willing, if somebody has time, um, and it is effortful and time consuming to have a support group, it would bring people in. I just wanted to say in follow-up to that, I was at a poster that I did yesterday, and this um, man came up and said, I'm really no one, and I was, well, I don't, of course you're someone, but what he was <laughs> was the husband of someone with PPAOS, actually. And he said just what you just said now is there's no place for them to go to be with people that understand them and can help them. And he's linked into some good places, or they are, but he spoke directly to that. So I think that really does seem like a very good direction. So thank you for that very much. Hello, Dr. Hillis. Um, I'm Fatima, again, from Ohio University. Um, my first question is um, regarding the core features or the um, associated features for the different types of PPA. Um, do you have any specific reading or writing features that can be related to the different types of PPA? So the question was, are there specific reading or writing features related to each of these variants? Um, I actually published a paper on this a long time ago on the well, I don't know, a couple, of, several years ago, on the the spelling uh, types associated with different primary progressive aphasias. There's not a one-to-one -one correlation. The most strong association is that the semantic variant have this sort of surface dyslexia and surface dysgraphia, um, and that patients with non-fluent variant have um, agrammatic writing very often. They often have um, more trouble with verbs than nouns, as I mentioned. But they can have a variety of types of spelling problems and reading problems. Sometimes we see, um, and I, you know, maybe Joe can say more to this, but I've seen a couple of cases of deep dyslexia um, in patients with non-fluent variant, which is sort of surprising. You think, well, they don't have semantic deficits, but they're, the variant of a deep dyslexia where they say a semantic um, paraphasia, like they'll look at the word fox and say uh, wo woof, or you know, might distort it more than that, but say woof. Um, or if you ask them to spell fox, they'll, they'll write woof. Um, but then they'll say, uh, yeah, not that. They know it's not quite right, but it's similar. Um, so they're kind of aware of it. And if you give them a picture of a fox and a wolf and say, point to fox, they'll get it right. So they know the difference, but they do have these semantic um, problems. And um, sometimes they actually read and write. There have been several cases where they, their reading comprehension is better than their auditory comprehension. Um, so it's fairly late in the course. Um, so Audrey Holland actually published a paper ages ago on this where a patient with Pick's disease had, um, could write but couldn't speak and could um, understand written language more than he could understand spoken language. Um, and I've seen a, a few other cases like this, but they often do actually make semantic errors in auditory um, comprehension and auditory and uh, if you give them an auditory word, they might even write a semantic paraphasia. But if you give it to them in writing, they understand it much better. So they have some really interesting dissociations. There's not a single, um, there's not a single pattern in the non-fluent variant and logopenic variant, I think. <laughs> 
Well, in that case, um, how significant for like, clinicians to really identify the variants in order to plan for therapy? So that's a great idea. I think it's less important for you to identify it's just, this, I would say the same as for vascular aphasia syndromes. It's less ad important to identify the variant or the classification than to identify the problems that patient is having. Um, that that's really the important thing, is to characterize the best you can what problems the patient's having. If they have a praxy of speech, they have a praxy of speech, and you should treat that. If they have a gram agrammatic speech production, you should treat that. If it doesn't quite fit, because they also have word comprehension problems, treat the word comprehension problems and the agrammatic speech production. You don't care that they don't fit into a, into a, great, into a category very nicely. These are not perfect. Like I said, they're sort of clinical syndromes, and not everybody's going to fit. Half of our patients, it's just like the Boston Diagnostic Aphasia Examination, half patients are not classifiable. Um, and half the patients, or at least a a quarter of the patients are not classifiable using these variant, these categories I just described. Lastly, it's just my curiosity. With the TDCS, how feasible it is to be used in clinical setting? So it probably shouldn't be used in a clinical setting just yet. We need more data. We need more evidence that it's useful, um, particularly in this, in, in this condition. Um, but it is not difficult to use. So I think if we get enough data, there's a lot of evidence that it works, that it's more useful than language therapy alone, then it should be used in a clinical setting. And if it proves to be, it's very easy and very inexpensive. Thank you. Yeah, hi, thanks for the great talk. My name is Jordan Green. I'm from MGH Institute of Health Professions. And maybe I missed this, but for the TDCS, was that a nodal? And if so, what was the rationale for using that over cathodal? Oh, great, I maybe didn't say it. It was a nodal. Um, and so there just seems, there's evidence in post-stroke aphasia for both anodal and cathodal TDCS plus language therapy. Most of the time the cathodal has been over the right hemisphere, and the idea is that cath so anodal has very um, predictable effects on membrane excitability. It, it, it increases membrane excitability. Cathodal has very inconsistent effects in language. Um, and so it can either increase or decrease membrane excitability. So we, um, we thought anodal just had, a, was a little bit more predictable, that it might improve language therapy. Um, but certainly empirically, there's almost as much evidence for using cathodal um, in the opposite hemisphere. It would make less sense in the PPA patients than in stroke patients because um, in PPA patients, they have atrophy. You don't know that that's an undamaged area in the right hemisphere. They do have some disease in the right hemisphere. So even if you think cathodal is inhibiting something in the right hemisphere, you, you may not want to do that in PPA patients because there is disease in the right hemisphere too. So it it's just seems like there's less evidence for doing it. Um, as somebody pointed out yesterday, um, you know, we don't know if you inhibit things in the right hemisphere, you might be inhibiting things that are good in the right hemisphere. Um, so people need to study that a little more. So we just thought this would be a better approach. Hi, I'm Suma Devanga. Uh, my question is, um, if the TDCS studies um, used any social validity measures um, to measure the life participation functions of people with the uh, primary progressive aphasia, and um, if yes, uh, what were the assessment measures that you used? Thank you. So that's a great question, and the answer is no. <laughs> Sorry. Um, we have added in the current trial some quality of life measures, um, and uh, a lot of these patients are not participating, to be honest, very much in society. Um, so they, they just aren't. Um, some of them are, though. Um, and so it would be a great idea. But uh, right now, we mostly have quality of life measures. Hi, I'm Isabel Hubbard from uh, University of California, San Francisco, and University of Texas at Austin. Um, I've been thinking a lot about uh, TDCS and uh, its effect on disease process in primary progressive aphasia. 
And I was wondering if you could tell me a little bit more about what you think the stimulation is doing to the tissue that is unaffected, but as you point out time and time again, beautifully in stroke aphasia, that unaffected tissue isn't necessarily healthy tissue and it may be vulnerable to disease. So do you have a theory for how the stimulation maybe positively or negatively impacts its vulnerability, especially in the language network? Well, so there are, you're right, there are neurons that drop out, um, but there are also neurons that are alive. You know, these people are producing speech and language. Um, so the network is there, and, and we have done fMRI, TAS-related fMRI studies. I mean, it's a great question, but um, there, we've done some TAS-related fMRI studies, and they do show a, a you know, a, a network associated with language production. So there's still a language network in there. So those neurons are working together to produce language. So we think if you stimulate, as I mentioned, stimulation is very broadly localized. So we think if you do the task at the same time and you, and, and you do TDCS, the TDCS is going to change the membrane excitability over that network, wherever it is, it's finding those healthy neurons that ex still exist and are then are doing language when they can do it. Um, so I think that that's what it's doing, is that they're making those neurons that are still there and still healthy and still able to produce a correct response more able, more likely to fire the next time they get the stimulus. Um, so that's what LTP is. It's, it just, you know, makes it more likely to fire with the same stimulus the next time. Oh, thanks. And where was your cathodal placement? So we do one, uh, so what Kirana Tipkini does, who's my colleague who's actually carrying out this, is um, she does IFG and then the control is actually on the jaw. Um, and she's worked with um, Marian Bixom, who's localized this now to show that that actually does um, show most active change or shows the, the most um, activity in kind of Broca's area. Yeah. I'm very fortunate to be in the area of the RTP in North Carolina where there is UNC and Duke both running PPA <coughs> clinics and um, do a team evaluation with social workers and um, the neurologist. But the, uh, and I run a nonprofit organization for people of aphasia, and our goal is life participation. So we actually um, have run primary progressive aphasia groups. We used to put the people with PPA into the regular aphasia groups, and that didn't work. And as our population increased, which we get a lot of referrals for PPA um, because of the location I think we're in. Um, we had to separate that group out. And then we have to further separate it now to a lower level group and a higher level group because yeah. people that are more recently diagnosed are freaked out by people that have started to have some um, behavioral components. So that's one issue. The second issue is that while, the, while UNC and Duke both do really good jobs, if, if we can get to, although they've usually seen another neurologist who has either not known what it was or said, yeah, you have PPA and I'll see you in six months or a year and doesn't make any other referrals. Um, our issue is that speech pathologists, my colleague, we don't do individual therapy at the nonprofit. So I refer out for speech therapy and the speech therapists are very um, concerned about the insurance okaying therapy because it says progressive. Um, and they need a quicker battery than, you know, some of the testing that you had suggested, which I agree with, but could you identify maybe some of the tests that they really should kind of rise to the top and then, you know, how to reassure them that this therapy is doing some good and especially in collaboration with a nonprofit like us. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, um, all of those are good, good points. Um, and I think the, we also see, you know, such a difference between the sort of very high level people who are still participating in society. And actually I tell them that, that is the most important thing that they can do. That I think that that is what predicts whether they're going to decline, at least in some cases, decline quickly versus slowly, is if they still try to participate. Um, I had one patient, 
who even after he was mute, he stopped working um, in a, his previous job, which was like as a lawyer or something, but he was delivering flowers because it was something he could do. He didn't actually have to talk to people when he delivered flowers. He just wanted to keep participating in society. You know, if they have that drive and they do things, you know, one of my patients still runs marathons and, you know, they, if they still do things um, and do a lot of activities that are interesting and require some contact, like, you know, they just have to keep talking um, the best they can. I think they do better. Um, your other question was about a quick battery. And, you know, identify, there, it doesn't take that long to identify um, the, some of the core features. So I did this, told you about the 14 item semantic test. Um, Joe, I think, will probably tell you a little bit about the rating scale for apraxia of speech um, that they use, and it doesn't take a, a really long time to do that. Um, grammatical speech production, the best thing you can do is listen to them, I think. Um, it's really hard to quantify, but um, I think we'll, um, we're trying to develop a way to quantify that um, a little bit better than, or more quickly. There's lots of analyses, but they take forever to do. Um, and maybe some of the things that are coming out of aphasia bank for analyses are going to be um, the most useful there that you don't actually, that are sort of automated analyses. Um, so we've just, we've just given some, um, a lot of our PPA um, analyses to the, uh, to uh, one of our collaborators who's going to uh, have them analyze um, um, using some of the aphasia bank analyses. So we'll see if we can find something that uh, evaluates that. Rep sentence repetition is very rapid. The NAC um, subset, subtest for sentence repetition takes, I don't know, two minutes. Um, but you can, you can have them repeat sentences from the Boston diagnostic aphasia examination or whatever aphasia test you like. Um, so none of these things take a really long time. Um, so I wouldn't, you know, there is no PPA battery that I know of, um, but I think you can evaluate for these core features. Thank you so much. This is wonderful. Um, my name is Becky Kayum, and I um, collaborate with uh, Northwestern, and I see most of Dr. Mejlum's uh, patients. And to answer the last question, I. Um, I bill Medicare all the time, so um, this is what I have found to be helpful. It really depends if you're a speech language pathologist, if you're going to be doing this for a diagnostic purpose, or if you're really going to be doing this for treatment. And if you're on a team helping to diagnose someone with PPA, obviously then you'll be doing a lot of standardized tests. But I think most of the speech therapists who are in the clinics, um, they've already gotten the diagnosis. So what I find is most helpful is more of a life participation person-centered um, approach. So I will really focus the evaluation on just talking with the person and their spouse and finding out, uh, you know, what their um, frustrations are. And I completely agree that subtyping and focusing the treatment strategies on subtyping, um, to me, I don't do that either. I look at the clinical profile and what their strengths and weaknesses are, but even more importantly, um, what's frustrating to them. How you get reimbursement for that is all in how you write the goals. So Medicare is very, very um, concerned about functional goals and meaningful goals. They're focusing more on um, person um, or the patient uh, rated outcomes. And so if you are focusing all of your goals on their frustrations of what they want to work on, and then you make them measurable and you make them attainable. So even if they need a moderate level of cueing to use a communication book, that's okay. That's increasing communication, and that way um, we can document that and show Medicare that absolutely we can very much show um, a level, you know, in functional progress. Uh, a lot of standardized tests would not reflect that progress. So what I'll do is throw in a couple of subtests at the end of my evaluation. Just if Medicare is auditing, they will see the subtests on there. But while I'm proving uh, medical necessity is through my functional goals and outcomes. So anyways, um, thank you so much. And I, I was curious to hear, um, is the language uh, study that, that you're starting with Georgetown, is it opening soon or is it already enrolling? Uh, right um, we've now? actually been going on for five years. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. is, okay. Is it um, a general language study or what kind of strategies? Are so it's really to improve or maintain naming. 
Okay. Um, so it's with all variants, um, oh, and beautiful. it's using a lot of repetition and copying and so on. Um, oh. So it is, um, you know, we will be submitting for competing renewal, but it is currently in its fifth, or it's about to be in its fifth year. Oh, wonderful. So Thanks. I guess we've been going on four years. Um, it's just starting its fifth year. Okay. Oh, thank you. That's good to know. Um, so thank you very much for your comments. And Medicare, I'm sure you all know this, but Medicare did make a um, decision a couple of years ago that you don't really have to show progress or improvement in people with neurodegenerative disease. Is it, that it is okay to show that people with neurodegenerative disease are just maintaining improvement. As long as your goals reflect that and you show that they are maintaining improvement despite the fact that they have a neurodegenerative disease, which would otherwise deteriorate, then they supposedly will continue to pay. It's not an excuse to say that they're not improving if they have a neurodegenerative disease. Um, so I really appreciated your comments. And, and the other thing about the, the variance I think there is usefulness of the variants, but they are more for research and for um, helping us identify more as ne perhaps as neurologists, but you all also for predicting what other problems they might develop. So, you know, if they have non-fluent variant, they might develop um, problems with, and you can look for this too, for problems with swallowing problems or problems with using their right hand. You know, it kind of predicts the, the next things that might come up because of the underlying disease. If they have semantic variant, you might look for behavioral problems. It might not surprise you that they have poor insight and comportment problems that might interfere with their um, ability to carry out your goals for um, interacting in society. Um, they become disinhibited and that kind of thing. So it can help you adjust your, your goals if you know what to expect. Lovely. Well, uh, I would like to thank you, Dr. Hillis, for a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you.